So gratified after we made the offer to Chris and he accepted. So many people around the country, I told them that Chris Tomlin's going to say, wow, you're getting Chris Tomlin. So he clearly meets the criterion of being a wow faculty. By every measure, he's a star in his field. He has very distinguished academic credentials. He has a bachelor's and a master's from Oxford University, a master's in University of Sussex, and also a master's and a PhD from Johns Hopkins University. He's taught at a number of universities throughout the world. He taught for a time at Latrobe University in Melbourne. He's taught in England. He's taught at law schools in Israel. He's taught at a number of law schools in the United States, including especially Northwestern. He's also been a visitor at William and Mary Law School. He's in 18 years in a very prestigious position as a research fellow and research professor at the American Bar Foundation. He's the author of six books. Definitive History of American Law, that he co-authored, and just this last year, a book that received wonderful reviews and awards, Freedom Bound. Now, one of the great traditions in our law school is you actually get a chair when you become an endowed <laughs> professor. <laughs> and so, um, this is, Chris, you can... And this is the type of chair that you have. <laughs> as soon as it comes from the factory, which is, of course, based on the wonderful rocking chairs we have in the library. So please join me in congratulating Chris on coming to the great honor to be elected to a chancellor's chair uh, here at UCI. It's, it's a very elegant name, a very simple name, Chancellor's Professor. It's very spare, it's unadorned. I find that extraordinarily appealing. Aesthetically, it's so precise. And deeply grateful to the law school uh, and to the university there is seen fit to bestow this distinction on me. And so now, uh, as is the nature of these things, that uh, you all have to listen to me for a while. <laughs> um, I invite you to leave the 21st century with all its trials and tribulations, leave it to its own devices for a little while, just for about an hour, and to come with me, if you will, to the early republic, uh, where together we can examine republican law. As is so often the case in American history, rather too often, in my view, but justifiably in this particular instance, we begin with the American Revolution. The American Revolution was deeply conditioned by law. It was undertaken by law-minded people in vindication of a form of government by the rule of law. The republic that the American Revolution began was shaped just as decisively by law, specifically by a revolution in the law. Republican law was conceived during that first revolution, and it was molded by the second. So it bore the marks of both. This meant that Republican law expressed the latent and at times explicit tension between a revolutionary people imbued with a sense of law as possibility 
and a constituted polity in which law placed limits on possibility. Each of these two revolutions had an elevated surface with earthier underpinnings. The first was a creature of the 18th century. It began as a crisis within a polycentric Anglophone legal culture that in the absence of constitutional consensus degenerated into a transatlantic civil war. The second revolution was a departure from the 18th century. We remember it as the painstaking transformation of plural, provincial sensibilities into a distinctively American rule of law, anchored by the first uh, written constitution in the world, and by a judiciary whose ultimate authority to expand the meaning of that constitution served the republic as a process of high political education. In the 1830s, Perhaps believing he was bearing witness to lessons successfully taught, Alexis de Tocqueville identified the spirit of the law abroad in the Republic as an outward, and more importantly, a downward emanation. Born, he wrote, within schools and courts, it infiltrates through society down to the lowest ranks, till finally the whole people have contracted the ways and tastes of a magistrate. Now, Tocqueville, of course, was writing in some relief. In a democratic republic, the absolute sovereignty of the will of the majority was at once the essence of government and its greatest danger. Laws identified capacities to neutralize the vices inherent in popular government and insensibly mold the whole of society to its desire for us to be welcomed. But to be identifiable in the 1830s as a counter-majoritarian instrumentality, law had necessarily to have become something very different from that which it had been 50 years earlier. Americans of the revolutionary epoch had not in the least imagined law as a visitation from above. At the heart of their revolution had been their own law talk, what the legal historian Stephen Wolfe has described as an explosion of expressive legalism that in no sense began in the settled jurisprudence of courts. True enough, the patriot Whig law of the pre-revolutionary 1760s had made many appearances in formal legal discourse. It had been expressed in courtrooms by impassioned patriot practitioners like James Otis and John Adams. It had been implemented by duly constituted governmental institutions and their offices, by legislatures and town meetings by magistrates and jurors, but it had also been enforced by mobs. Who's to say which had imaginative priority, particularly when mob became meeting and then mob again, simply at the turn of an adjournment? Nor more important was the revolutionary era's expressive legalism confined to matters of government and politics, whether pursued by polite elites or unruly masses. Law talks spilled everywhere. A late 18th century American lingua franca simultaneously used to communicate legal decision-making, to ignite political mobilization, and to mock both the powerful and the powerless. We should therefore read Tocqueville not as identifying the origins of American legal culture, but rather what it had become. The revolution in American law turned the expressive legalism of the American Revolution into a legal culture that to an important degree no longer stood in solidarity with the people themselves. Hence the tension between law's two formative revolutions. As the Republic matured, that tension became even more apparent. Eventually, indeed, the tensions in Republican law would contribute to the great unraveling that would end in another civil war. Now, the dominant law of the American Revolution was, as I said, Whig law. Whig law was the lex loci of the colonies, plural, fluid, diffuse, decentralized, and communal, an internal police undertaken by diverse local publics through local institutions, notably jurors. As such, Whig law created conditions for the confrontations of the 1760s and for the American Revolution itself that accorded patriots a decisive advantage. American Whigs could go about the business of making a revolution without fear of arrest or attack by imperial authority because it was they 
who controlled the effective legal institutions of colonial society. In a polycentric legal universe, local leverage was what counted everywhere. Lacking it, imperial law, the law of parliamentary statutes, the law of crown officials, was simply anemic. <clears throat> Whig law's pervasive localism supported a conception of the relationship between colonies and metropolis in the, in the pre-revolutionary years at odds with metropolitan claims of sovereign imperial right. <coughs> metropolitan arguments represented the empire as a unified state under the direction of an omnipotent parliament. To the colonies, in contrast, the empire was a decentralized aggregation of relatively autonomous polities. These distinct perspectives were informed by distinct conceptions of the, of the constitution of the empire. From the perspective of the metropolis, the imperial constitution was coterminous with the 18th century British constitution of parliamentary supremacy. Colonies, to the extent that they had constitutional standing at all, were simply subordinate municipal entities encompassed by parliamentary authority. From the perspective of the colonies, in contrast, the imperial constitution was not a constitution of supremacy at all, but of accommodation and restraint. Its substance was to be found in custom. The actual practices and institutional arrangements that have characterized the relationship between metropolis and colony over time. These disclosed a steady growth of local autonomy and self-government, ancient liberties of the subject explicitly claimed and recognized, legislative assemblies granted and established, actual administrative capacities exercised and acknowledged. In each colony, the accumulation over time of, leg of leg legitimized rights and practices amounted to a local unwritten constitution. <coughs> Understood this way, the imperial constitution stood for a web of jurisdictional accommodations between plural customary colonial constitutions, each enjoying far more than merely municipal standing, and the metropolis. Its guiding principle, derived from English and British constitutional law since time immemorial, was consent. Americans were willing to concede that Parliament enjoyed a superintending authority over the empire as a whole, and hence that it might legislate in such wholly external and mutually advantageous areas as the regulation of commerce, to promote the general good of all. But they rejected any possible implication that superintendents of the empire as a whole granted Parliament a sovereign authority to intervene in the affairs of any particular colony. They imagined the imperial constitution, in other words, as a federalism of function. Through invocations of ancient English liberties and constitutional idioms provided much of the terminology in which American revolutionary legal thought was expressed, this language did not comprise the sum and extent of the era's exuberant legalism. The argument that Americans appealed to an old constitutionalism follows from a close examination of colonial constitutional and legal rhetoric, writes the political scientist Shannon Stimson. But it pays little attention, she continues, to the actual dynamics of colonial political and legal debate. In part, Stimson's critique is ideological. A renewed resort to a particular discourse cannot of itself tell us whether the user means to convey the same ideas as a predecessor. In larger part, though, she invites us to look beyond language to institutional practice, in particular to the demarcation of dural space, the space of legal decision. In revolutionary settings, she observes, contests over the locus and legitimacy of law-determining power are eminently political. The question of who controls the legal ground, who gives content and meaning to the law in such situations transcends the boundaries of legal technicalities. The courtroom becomes an active center for resolving contested claims of legitimacy within the state. As Stinson's proffered focus on the courtroom is itself somewhat limiting, the era's law talk traveled a long way beyond courtroom doors. It was, writes Wilf, an intoxicating mix of gossip, politics, sensationalism, tales of murder, not just astute attention to the procedural <coughs> norms that make law matter, but a vernacular culture of imaginary punishments, mock executions, stillborn reform proposals, fabular criminal narratives that departed the traditional conception 
of law as a hegemonic power of the state. In that departure, vernacular legal culture mouthed its rejection of law as any sovereign's command, and thereby became itself an imaginative maker of law. So the questions of the era's exuberant legalism posed were ultimately questions of power, for they challenged incipient state and professional monopolies in precisely the fashion Stimson suggests would occur in a revolutionary situation. And though they could and did arise outside courtrooms, the courtroom focused them with particular clarity. It should not be surprising, therefore, that it was the courtroom that gave Republican law its initial shape. So what is this Republican law? In its most basic articulation, Republican law means the law of a polity whose institutions derive all their powers, directly or indirectly, from the great body of the people. Law dedicated to the realization of liberty as a, as a public or collective, rather than simply a private or individual good. Law that cultivated the disinterested participation of free men in the community or politics civic processes, active involvement in making and executing decisions, sharing in the power of the state. Liberty in this sense was necessarily republican in the late 18th century. It could not exist in a monarchy. For an admirably pithy distillation of the republican rule of law, one could not ask for better than Thomas Paine's memorable remark that in America the law is king. As long as one does not forget the coda that Paine added, which held it no less essential that the fragments of law's crown be scattered among the people whose right it is. Both ideologically and institutionally, Republican law could and did blend with and build upon the common law constitutionalism that had armored the Patriot cause in the years before the Revolution. At least in its weak incarnation, the common law was zealous in defense of liberties. Common law constitutionalism tended to emphasize the liberty of the subject from arbitrary governors, rather than defining liberty as the participation of citizens in government. But in practice, it encompassed both by cataloging as civil rights of freeborn Englishmen, not simply rights to be secure in life, liberty, and property, but also rights of engagement and exercise. To be meaningful, rights to representation, to government by consent, to good government entailed action. They entailed the right to elect representatives, the right to petition in redress of grievances, the right to resist arbitrary rule. The common law, too, was local, and particularly in its claim to instantiate custom, it was communal. Both characteristics translated into Republican law's emphasis on active civic engagement. For in the colonies, at least, the common law was participatory. The common law right that patriots emphasized above all was trial by jury. In the Anglophone world at large, trial by jury was an essential element in the definition of restrained government. <laughs> Juries limited the capacity of official power to be arbitrary. In the American colonies, however, description of the jury granted it an additional valence that heightened its substantive authority beyond that of procedural restraint on judicial authority to become by the late 18th century, an embodiment of localized democracy in action. Just as the popular branch of the legislature should enjoy an absolute check in every act of the government, John Adams wrote in 1771, so the jury enabled the common people to exercise juridical sovereignty, as decisive a negative, he wrote, in every judgment of a court of judicature. This blur of traditional common law jury right with a quasi-republican emphasis on the jury as the embodiment of virtuous participation in the local determination of legal outcomes is on display in the definition of jury right that the Continental Congress offered the inhabitants of Quebec in October 1774. Trial by jury, said the Congress, meant that neither life, liberty, nor property could be taken from their possessor until 12 unexceptionable countrymen and peers, acquainted with the character of the accused and of the witnesses, should in open court pass their sentence upon oath, a sentence that could not injure the accused, 
without injuring their own reputation and perhaps their interests also, given that the question may turn on points that concern the general welfare, or at the very least might furnish a precedent that on a similar trial of their own may militate against themselves. Such revolutionary era sentiments summarized a long history of juries routinely exercising expansive authority, in particular authority to determine law itself rather than simply assess whether evidence presented proved the case of one or other party. As one looks generally over the various rules regulating the division between the functions of judge and jury, writes the, William, uh, writes the legal historian William Nelson of pre-revolutionary Massachusetts, it becomes clear that although the jury's power to find facts was limited by rules excluding relevant evidence and keeping the jury from weighing probability and credibility, its power to find law was virtually unlimited. Resort to English common law was attended by rejection of whatever parts of that law were deemed inconsistent with the jurors' views, whether of justice and morality or, more pragmatically, of local needs and circumstance. Such behavior represented a radical expansion of the space accorded to juries in English common law practice. 17th and 18th century English pronouncements flatly condemned as erroneous the possibility that jurors might be judges of the law as well as of fact. Such, according to Mr. Justice German in the 1649 trial of John Lilburn for treason, was enough to destroy all the law in the land. There was never such a damnable heresy broached in this nation before. In 1670, jurors who acquitted William Penn and William Meade in a prosecution brought for their violation of the Conventicle Act of 1664 were fined and imprisoned for their verdict because it was against the direction of the court in matter of law openly given and declared to them. The penalties were remitted by Lord Chief Justice Vaughan in Bushell's case in 1670, but they were remitted on grounds that the trial judge had impermissibly intruded upon the jury's determination of fact, not in vindication of the jury's right to ignore judicial direction on a matter of law. A century later, jurors invited by defendants to judge law and seditious libel prosecutions brought against Wilkite radicals were told by Lord Mansfield to be very sure that you determine according to law, for you act at your peril. When the newly appointed United States Supreme Court Justice James Wilson summarized the record of English opinion on the matter in his 1790-91 law lectures in Philadelphia, he held the division between the provinces of jury and judge well known, long recognized, and established. Wilson's lectures marked his election to a chair of law at the College of Philadelphia. They are justifiably famous. His inaugural lecture was a social event of considerable note. A gathering of the New Republic's governing elites that included the president, the First Lady, the Vice President, members of Congress, as well as members of the Pennsylvania Legislature. One might be forgiven for expecting that Justice Wilson would take the province of the judge as his text, but he did not. Though it might be of the greatest consequence to the law of England, he wrote, that the powers of the judges and jury be kept distinct, such was not the case in the New Republic. Suppose the law and the fact to be so closely interwoven that the determination of one must at the same time embrace the determination of the other. What must the jury do? The jury must do as they had in years past. They must decide the law as well as the fact. Wilson allowed that it might seem somewhat extraordinary to render 12 men untutored in the study of jurisprudence the ultimate interpreters of our law, for the power to overrule the direction of the judges who have made it the subject of long and elaborate researches. Yet, he continued, in a free country, every citizen forms a part of the sovereign power. He possesses a vote or takes a still more active part in the business of the Commonwealth. By voting, he takes a personal share in the executive and judicial departments of the nation. And as a matter of immense consequence, to individual litigants and to the public at large, he exercises the dignified function of a juror. He was, of course, entitled to seek the assistance of the judges, but Wilson was willing to leave the initiative 
in the province of the juror. For though jurors might make mistakes, even gross ones, their mistakes could not grow into a dangerous <coughs> system. Their native uprightness would not permit it. The esprit de corps will not be introduced among them, nor will society experience from them those mischiefs of which the esprit de corps, unchecked, is sometimes productive. Had Wilson cast about for others with equal faith in the common sense of juries, he would not have been hard put to find them at all. He would have found, for example, that Article 41 of the Georgia Constitution of 1777 provided, bluntly, the jury shall be judges of law as well as of fact, and forbade the bench from offering its opinion on points of law except when jurors expressly invited it to do so. Close to home, he would have found that New Jersey's Act for Regulating and Shortening the Procedures in the Courts of Law of 1784 prohibited any state court from setting aside any judgment obtained by verdict of a jury and allowed reversals only by the Court of Errors. Throughout the 1780s, courts from New England to Pennsylvania to the Chesapeake could be found according juries full recognition of, as judges of law as well as fact. Nowhere was the idea novel. But Wilson did not need others to buttress his faith in jurors. He had extensive experience of his own to draw upon. Years before, 13 years before, to be precise, when the outcome of the Revolutionary War had still been very much in doubt, Wilson had been one of a small group of lawyers deeply involved in the defense of 23 Philadelphia citizens found by a grand jury to have aided the British occupation of the city and indicted for treason. Two of the first three trials resulted in convictions, and both defendants, Abraham Carlyle and John Roberts, were hung. Thereafter, 18 of the remaining 20 defendants were acquitted. Analysis of this fascinating cluster of jury trials suggests that jurors were reluctant to see defendants convicted for acts that might have been morally, even legally blameworthy, but did not warrant execution. Both early convictions were accompanied by clemency petitions from the jurors themselves. They went unrequited. Having no means to avoid the death penalty by convicting the defendants of lesser offenses, jurors thereafter chose overwhelmingly to acquit. So doing, jurors risked the passions of the moment, for although there is clear evidence of community sympathy for convicted defendants, there is just as clear evidence of rising anger amongst patriots at the parade of acquittals. The anger culminated, indeed, in the famous Fort Wilson riot of October 1779, in which Wilson, James Wilson's uh, home was besieged by Philadelphia mobs. Himself the primary target of the riot, Wilson may well have had it in mind years later when he complimented jurors for their native uprightness and their resistance to a mischievous esprit de corps. Those Philadelphia treason trials provide an unparalleled cache of data on revolutionary era jurors. And rather more besides, analysis of the record of jurors recovered from 22 of the trials indicates that the trial jurors were indeed for the most part, as the Continental Congress had remarked, unexceptionable countrymen and peers of the defendants, unlike the grand jurors, who were on average substantially wealthier. More interesting, the record indicates that in all, only 58 men served on the treason trial juries, and the 245 of the 264 juror positions in the 22 trials were filled by an even smaller group of 39 men, accounting on average for more than six juror positions apiece. One juror, John Drinker, served on 20 of the 22 juries. Isaac Powell and Thomas Palmer each served on 17. Cadwallader Dickinson served on 15. The pattern of repeat service was accounted for by the skillful exercise by defendants' counsel of their common law right to 35 peremptory challenges, that is, to object without cause to up to three complete jurors. The 19 one-time jurors mostly appear in early trials and on juries that convicted defendants. As the trials wore on and familiarity with the juror pool increased, challenges winnowed out hostile jurors, improving defendants' chances of acquittal. 
but challenges reduced the pool that was small to begin with. In all, the county sheriff returned a panel of 76 jurors, 13 of whom failed to appear at all. The treason trial's small jury pool and high incidence of repeat service both reproduce the dynamics of criminal justice within a tightly bounded community. Other aspects of the trials carry the same connotation. Witness lists for the trials have their own pattern of repeat service for both prosecution and particularly for defendants. Witnesses included both grand jurors and members of the trial jury pool. In otherwise exclusively masculine proceedings, witness lists included large numbers of women, heavily skewed toward defendants. Webs of connection, both social and familial, linked witnesses, grand jurors, trial jurors, and defendants. Jurors not only testified for and against defendants and signed clemency petitions for those they had convicted, they also stood surety in several cases for those acquitted, but nevertheless bound to good behavior. Now, in a city population of 30,000, such connections are not all that surprising. Still, they suggest a pattern in late 18th century legal culture exposed in much greater depth in recent research on North and South Carolina that tells us much about the nature of Republican law. In her recent book, The People and Their Peace, Laura Edwards describes post-revolutionary legal culture as profoundly decentralized, rooted in localities and their institutions of governance, in magistrates' hearings, inquests, and other ad hoc forums, where local custom, politics, and law mingled freely, where local knowledge and local decisions constituted law. This is no simple rural remnant of times gone by. Legal localism was produced by the revolutionary era's radical decentralization of government, a blend of new and old that brought revolutionary ideals of participatory government and local control to bear on established legal practices, notably the venerable and widespread tradition of the peace, a tradition with obvious English common law resonance. Patriarchal and hierarchical in appearance, the peace of its preservation granted everyone situated within the compass of the locality some quantum of capacity, of relevant opinion and influence, irrespective of whether they could be considered bearers of civic rights, as is the case, of course, of white men, or not, as is the case of the poor women, even the enslaved. Each local jurisdiction produced its own inconsistent rulings aimed at restoring the peace. Jurors deciding law as well as fact in legal proceedings throughout the settled extent of the new republic was simply one facet of legal localism in action. This legal localism is the hidden underbelly of republican law. It is as much in evidence in northern cities as in the southern counties that Edwards inspected. In the Philadelphia of the treason trials, for example, long into the 19th century, the vast bulk of criminal prosecutions occurred before disaggregated aldermanic courts, directly servicing mostly poor victims of minor offenses. In city and country both, the measure of local law was its ability to craft acceptable outcomes in the endless disputes and petty regulations that defined daily life. It gave concrete incarnation to a long-established Anglophone discourse of peace, welfare, and good government. Localism was the hidden underbelly of Republican law, because although it persisted deep into the 19th century, localism was rendered largely invisible by its very lack of system. Localized law did not represent or even aim to represent a coherent or uniform view of the law based on outcomes. Its records and decisions were authored by a wide range of people with direct interests in particular local conflicts not in the concept of law as a systematic or abstract body of knowledge. Legal localism and professional juridical legality represented distinct state forms, a bifurcation of revolutionary Republican legality into two 19th century streams. Where the streams coincided, the workings of legal localism were easily overshadowed and effaced by the activities of juridical elites for whom law was precisely a systematic abstract body of knowledge. Conceiving themselves members of a national political and legal culture, juridical elites pursued the creation of a learned legal order of appellate decisions, statutes, and legal treatises, a pyramidical order with a hierarchical institutional structure 
that located authority at the top where trained professionals might ensure the spread of uniformity. For all his apparent sympathy for that potent symbol of localized law, the jury, Justice James Wilson provides us with an early measure both at the extent of the infant republic's professionalized legal culture and of its accompanying tendency to efface localism. We've seen that in his law lectures, Wilson was entirely willing to affirm that jurors possess the power of determining legal questions, but he continued, <laughs> They must determine those questions as judges must determine them, according to law. Jurors could not make it up. Law, particularly the common law, is governed by precedents and customs and authorities and maxims, all alike obligatory upon jurors as upon judges in deciding questions of law. As citizens, jurors had a responsibility to acquire, as far as they possibly could, knowledge of the laws of their country. Should they require further instruction, jurors might turn to judges, whose peculiar province, Wilson wrote, it is to answer questions of law. Having received advice upon the law, they have the right of judging for themselves. But to this right corresponded the duty of judging properly. Should they fail to acquit themselves properly, the court, if dissatisfied with their verdict, will exercise the power of granting a new trial. In soft Mansfeldian tones, what he had appeared to give the jury with one hand, Wilson took back with the other. Throughout his colloquy on the provinces of jury and judge, Wilson was not particularly complimentary toward the New Republic's judges. His deprecation was gentle. They filled their offices usefully, honorably. The problem was that in many respectable courts within the United States, the judges are not gentlemen of professional requirements. Lacking the necessary acquaintance with the law, how might judges assist jurors? How direct others who themselves know not the road? The answer was obvious. Those who expect to fill the offices of judges in courts ought to make the strongest efforts in order to obtain a respectable degree of knowledge in the law. So should the legislature. Indeed, the science of law, he wrote, should be the study of every free citizen and of every free man. By measured degree, then, Wilson's lectures wrapped the exercise of governance, juridical and legislative, national and local, in the science of law. The law, Wilson imagined, was indubitably a republican, though he made due obeisance to the common law's English luminaries, to Fortescue, to Cook, to Blackstone. He countered their influence by stressing the sovereign power of the citizenry, the revolution principle, affirmed in the Constitution of the United States and of every state in the Union, that the dread and redoubtable sovereign, when traced to his ultimate and genuine source, has been found in the free and independent man. Though neglected or despised by the English, this was the first and fundamental principle in the science of government. It followed then that an American legal education ought not to be constructed upon a foundation of the Constitution of, and government and laws of England, but from our own. Yet once Wilson had begun his exposition of the science of the law in detail, he would identify the mode for the promulgation of human laws that he considered the best evidence of law introduced by common consent, not as one might expect given his desire to expand the science of the law on the basis of the principles of our constitutions and governments and law, not as legislation, but surprisingly, as custom. The essence of law, said Wilson, was a rule prescribed, but a rule unknown to those whose conduct it was intended to shape could never be termed law. There were many ways in which laws might be made known. They may be printed and published. Written copies of them may be deposited in public libraries or other places where everyone interested may have an opportunity of perusing them. They may be proclaimed in general meetings of the people. But just as written laws bind us for no other reason than because they are received by the judgment of the people, so also those laws that the people have approved without writing were just as obligatory on all. For where is the difference? Whether the people declare their will by the suffrage or by their conduct, custom, 
long and universal practice was superior to legislation, certainly to the legislation of princes and despotic parliaments, but also, it seemed, to that of our own constituted governments. For custom pointed to consent upon the most solid basis, experience as well as opinion. It pointed to consent practically given, thus given in the freest and most unbiased manner. So described, custom could well seem an accommodation and not an effacement of the legal localism that I've described as the underbelly of Republican law. For that was also the experience of the community set over against the opinion of political elites. But Wilson was not quite finished in his explanation of custom. How was a custom introduced? By voluntary adoption. How did it become general? By the instances of voluntary adoption being increased. How did it become lasting? By voluntary and satisfactory experience, which ratified and confirmed what voluntary adoption had introduced in the introduction, in the extension, in the continuance of customary law, we find the operations of consent universally predominant. Generality, continuity, universality. These were the markers of custom as consent. Rather than localized law, particularized, discontinuous, unsystematic, what we are encountering here is the professionalized common law the law of precedence and authorities and maxims, the law that should be known by the judge and that was obligatory upon the locality and its jurors alike. It had a noble heritage. It was animated by the spirit of liberty, worked pure by rules drawn from the fountain of justice. It had been savior of the states of America from the claims of the British Parliament. As it turned out, the common law and common law constitutionalism were, after all, the principles of our constitution and government and law. The law upon which Wilson's science of law was founded, the law that American judges and citizens alike had a responsibility to learn. James Wilson's invocation of custom as the acme of consent enabled him to appropriate the common law he venerated as foundation to the Republican science of government he professed. The foundational importance Wilson accorded the common law is quite plain in the plan of his lectures, which introduced custom early amid general principles of law and obligation amongst which it is ranked the highest, while delaying discussion of the Constitution and Government of the United States of Pennsylvania and her sister commonwealths until he turned to examine municipal law, rule by which a state or nation is governed. Arriving at that examination, we find further strictures upon legislation, favorably contrasting the Union and its several commonwealths with the legislative despotism of Parliament enunciated by Blackstone, as he put it, as Blackstone put it, supreme, irresistible, absolute, uncontrolled. Wilson noted that in American legislative authority, in America, legislative authority had been placed as it ought to be, under just and strict control. The statement followed entirely genuinely from the vital principle Wilson had embraced at the outset, that the supreme or sovereign power of the society resides in the citizens at large, who should therefore exercise a superintending power over the extravagances of their legislatures. But how concretely was that power to be exercised? Sometimes by the executive, the answer. Sometimes by the judicial authority of the government. Sometimes even by a private citizen. For the Republic's executive and judicial authorities were, well, Wilson emphasized, no less than the legislature, the child of the people. Old prejudices that identified legislatures alone as the people's representatives had no place in the Republic. The executive represented the people in managing their affairs with promptitude, activity, firmness, consistency, energy. The judicial authority represented the people by applying according to the principles of right and justice the constitution of laws to facts and transactions in cases. Among the three powers of government, there should exist both independence and a mutual dependency. Thus, in exercising the legislative power of the United States, Congress should enjoy a complete independency in preparing bills, in debating them, in passing them, in refusing to pass them. But after legislative proceedings, 
where at an end the product was to be examined and subjected to a given degree of control by the executive. Here is the dependency, said Wilson, of the legislative power. Likewise, legislation was subject to another given degree of control by the judiciary department whenever the laws, though in fact passed, are found to be contradictory to the Constitution. Wilson expanded on the matter in a second lecture. Suppose that the legislature pass an act manifestly repugnant to some part of the Constitution, and that the matter should come in due course before a court, forming a portion of the judicial department, whose business it was to administer justice according to the law of the land. One of them must, of necessity, give place to the other. It was the right and duty of the court to decide which. A decision Wilson contended that was very simple. The supreme power of the United States is given one rule. A subordinate power in the United States is given a contradictory rule. The former is the law of the land as of a, nece as of a necessary consequence. The latter is void and has no operation. The boundaries of the legislative power were thereby distinctly marked and effectual and permanent provision made against every transgression. Wilson did not expound directly upon the superintending role of the private citizen. We might suppose he had juries in mind, although we have seen that Wilson did not allow juries the independence in matters of law of the same order of independence he accorded courts. An alternative possibility is that Wilson had in mind the private citizen's right to litigate. To litigate, of course, when he did a court, which necessarily rendered the citizen superintending power subject to the higher superintendence of the science of the law. But Wilson would demonstrate that he thought the law should superintend the citizen's right to litigate expansively. In Chisholm against Georgia in 1793, he would join Chief Justice John Jay, Justices Blair, and Cushing to deny Georgia's claim to sovereign immunity and affirm the right of individual citizens of one state to sue another. It was, he said, a case of uncommon magnitude. The furious reaction to the decision bore him out. The Georgia House of Representatives adopted legislation making any attempt to act on the decision a capital crime. Within two years, 12 states had ratified the 11th Amendment, withdrawing from the Judiciary Department power to hear any suit in law or equity commenced or prosecuted against one of the United States by citizens of another state or by citizens or subjects of any foreign state. Our glass would say Act Three. <laughs> James Wilson died in 1798 in a debtor's prison in Edenton, North Carolina, caught up in the backwash of the same speculative collapse that snared Robert Morris, the mighty Morris. The prison is full of the most reputable merchants, Thomas Jefferson wrote to Madison. It is understood that the scene is not yet got to its height. By the time the scene had reached its height, Jefferson and Madison had more on their minds than bankrupt founding fathers. 1798 was the year of the XYZ affair, of the Federalist Reign of Terror, of the Alien and Sedition Acts, and of the Kentucky and Virginia Resolves, a year that congealed into the worst crisis in the short history of the American Republic. It was also the year that William Manning of Billericay, Massachusetts, completed his tract, The Key of Liberty, an extraordinary grassroots defense of free Republican governments from the machinations of their judicial and executive officers, who in favor of the interests of the few had distorted the true sense and meaning of the constitutions and laws in order to raise themselves above the legislative power and take the whole administration of government into their own hands. Confronted by what appeared to him almost an elite coup d'etat against popular democracy, Manning argued the only salvation lay in nationwide political association to engender an alternative politics. Now, William Manning was no revived anti-federalist any more than Jefferson or Madison. He had supported adoption of the federal constitution, though he quickly became disenchanted 
at the manner of its implementation, disgusted in particular by the firm grasp on government of lawyers whom he called leading allies of the few in conniving to keep the laws numerous, intricate, and as inexplicit as possible. Manning was rather a plebeian democratic republican whose critical assaults on the decades federalist elites had anticipated by some years the more polite disquiet of dinner party agitators like Thomas Jefferson. Still, 1798 pulled both Jefferson and Madison into the fray. That year, the alliance of high and low, of national and local interests in league against federalist policies solidified. The flashpoint was provided by the Adams administration's Alien and Sedition Acts, and by the answering Kentucky and Virginia resolves. The Alien Act authorized the president to deport any alien considered dangerous to the peace and safety of the United States. The Sedition Act revived the old English tactic of using seditious libel prosecutions to silence political opponents of the government. Madison's Virginia resolves, elegant and menacing, warned with deep regret that the federal government was engaging in forced constructions of the Constitution that threatened to consolidate the states by degree into one sovereignty and to transform the present Republican system of the United States into an absolute, or at best, a mixed monarchy. Underlining that the powers of the federal government resulted from the compact to which the states are parties and were limited by the plain sense and intention of the instrument constituting the compact, the Virginia Resolves reserved to the states a right to interpose for arresting the progress of the evil and for maintaining within their respective limits the authorities' rights and liberties appertaining to them. Jefferson's Kentucky Resolves by comparison, verbose and flamboyant, made the same general case against the administration but proposed a distinct remedy. In case of an abuse of the delegated powers, the members of the general government being chosen by the people, a change by the people would be the constitutional remedy. But where powers are assumed which have not been delegated, a nullification of the act is the rightful remedy. Every state, Jefferson argued, had a natural right, in cases not within the compact, to nullify of their own authority all assumptions of powers by others within their limits. Though both Madison and Jefferson adopt the same theory of the Federal Union as a compact of the states, they both condemned the Alien and Sedition Act as a violation of the constitutional principle of limited government and though it was Madison who wrote ominously of the threat of federal consolidation, it is Jefferson's natural right of, no, of state nullification, grounded, it would appear, on a natural law claim of revolution that attracts attention. And indeed, there was an important distinction between the positions adopted by Madison and Jefferson. As an invocation of natural law in cases not within the compact, Jefferson's claim of a natural right of nullification was extra-constitutional. Madison's theory of interposition, in contrast, was a theory of state guardianship exercised within the existing constitutional framework. In fact, the Kentucky legislature did not adopt Jefferson's remedy when it was first presented in October 1798, and so failed to embrace state powers to nullify. Only 15 months later, when the crisis had passed, and Kentucky in particular had been isolated by attacks upon the resolutions from other states claiming that the general government was the exclusive judge of the extent of the powers delegated to it, did the legislature finally follow Jefferson's lead. Interestingly enough, Jefferson himself did not take a direct part in drafting Kentucky's response, which gave notification a distinctly Madisonian twist. To leave the question to the judgment of the general government, it stated, would be nothing short of despotism, since the discretion of those who administer the government and not the Constitution would be the measure of their powers. The several states who formed that instrument, being sovereign and independent, have the unquestionable right to judge of its infraction. The rightful remedy of acts unauthorized by the Constitution, then Kentucky continued, was a nullification by those sovereigns. In the controversy over the Alien and Sedition Acts, Jefferson had furnished indignant verbiage, but it was Madison's spare language of a constitutional right 
to seek interposition that constituted the real response. Now, embracing Madison's theory of state guardianship, the Virginia Resolves did not clearly indicate how it would be exercised. Elements of the Resolves appeared to identify interposition as an act of state legislatures. They spoke of the duty of the state's General Assembly to watch over and oppose violations of the federal constitution. However, the Resolves also made specific mention of the state convention that had ratified the federal constitution in the first place and explicitly conditioned opposition to the Sedition Act upon that convention's express declaration that among other essential rights, the liberty of conscience and of the press cannot be canceled, abridged, restrained, or modified by any authority of the United States. This implied that while declarations of unconstitutionality might be made by watchful legislatures, remedial action, that is, the act of interposition itself, was a matter like ratification for the people themselves in convention assembly. Madison would make this point explicitly, both in correspondence with Jefferson and in his own detailed rebuttal of Federalist criticism of the Virginia Resolves. Interposition, Christian Fritz has concluded, meant that the states considered as the people in their highest sovereign capacity remained the rightful judges in the last resort of the constitutionality of acts of the federal government. In this crucial sense, interposition rested directly on the constitutional basis of popular sovereignty. Until 1798, arguments about the constitutional meaning of the people's sovereignty were untested. Even Federalists could argue that a form of popular sovereignty underlay their claims that the general government had exclusive jurisdiction to judge infractions of the Constitution. We've seen, after all, that James Wilson conceived of the judicial power of the United States as in the, as in the service of the dread and redoubtable sovereign, the free and independent man. Such had been the, te the tenor of the ratification debates. Though in Federalist 78, Hamilton had identified interpretation of the Constitution as the proper and peculiar province of the courts, he had also identified the court's exercise of interpretation as protection of the intention of the people, which in cases of conflict should always be preferred to the intention of their agents. In Federalist 39, Madison too had willingly assigned a decisive constitutional role to the Supreme Court. Conformable to the Republican standard, judicial officers of the Union would be the choice, through, though a remote choice, of the people themselves. Hamilton's judges, though, were to be effectively insulated from popular oversight, unelected, appointed during good behavior, independent. And as Wilson's lectures suggest, the law to which they would have resort in executing their role would be the polite, juristic, common law inflected discourse of the profession, untouched by the local knowledge of ordinary people. Hence the significance of the Kentucky, in particular, and in particular, the Virginia Resolves, they identified a significantly expanded range of participants in constitutional interpretation. They identified a polycentric constitutionalism for the Republic. Expanded polycentric constitutionalism of the late 1790s would resurface periodically in Republican law. However, claims to a final popular authority beyond the jurisdiction of actually existing governmental institutions, which nevertheless remained within the ambit of the Constitution, were unavailing. Kentucky and Virginia were both shouted down in the Alien and Sedition Act crisis, though the election of 1800 largely launched the boil of discontent, the Marshall Court would entrench a distinctly legalistic style of Federalist ideology suspicious of localist democracy in Republican constitutional discourse. Marshall himself was no consolidationist. Federal courts did not penetrate deeply into the early republic's local life, but where they did penetrate, they implanted decidedly nationalist and federalist views. So in Fletcher against Peck, for example, the Marshall Court set aside a 1796 Georgia statute rescinding the fraudulent Yazoo land sale engineered the previous year by widespread bribery of state legislators 
not only on grounds that the statute violated the federal constitution's prohibition of laws impairing the obligation of contracts, but also that it was in any case for courts and not for a legislature to exercise review of the legislature's prior activities. That the rescission had resulted from a statewide political movement to replace the corrupt legislature, culminating in a constitutional convention called to enable and approve the rescission was treated as utterly irrelevant. The real party, it is said, are the people. And when their agents are unfaithful, the acts of those agents cease to be obligatory. It is, however, Marshall continued, to be recollected that the people can act only by those agents, and that while within the powers conferred on them, their acts must be considered as the acts of the people. Twenty years later, nullifiers would mobilize in precisely the same fashion and to the same effect in another southern state, South Carolina, this time behind the claim that a single state might nullify a federal law by act of a constitutional convention. They met the same response. Defenders of the Supreme Court's exclusive jurisdiction over the Constitution recoiled at the illogic of multiple constitutional interpreters. Instead of one supreme judicial tribunal with power to decide for all, Daniel Webster asked rhetorically, shall constitutional questions be left to four and twenty popular bodies, each at liberty to decide for itself and none bound to respect the decision of others? <coughs> Alexis de Tocqueville's American tour, where we began, coincided with the later stages of the South Carolina nullification crisis. Webster's indignation perhaps helps explain the observation for which Tocqueville is most famous, that there was hardly a political question in the United States which does not sooner or later turn into a judicial one. It confirmed that at least in matters of great constitutional moment, there was no jurisdictional space for popular action between the court's exercise of judicial review and the right to revolution. The delicious irony of the nullification crisis is that nullifiers so at odds with the single sovereignty of the federal government had as earnestly reconstructed their state government in South Carolina as the altogether abstract entity, the one supreme power they so despised when in Washington creating a political environment in South Carolina at odds with the plural decentralized structures in which localized law had flourished. By the 1830s, both nationally and locally, the people were being squeezed out of Republican law, both their sovereignty and their cells rendered more and more an abstraction. Now the result was not stasis. Local law did not cease to be, but it did become more detached more invisible, more nearly local. Nationally, meanwhile, Webster's one tribunal became the site for a polycentric constitutionalism of all of its very own. As Mark Graeber has recently reminded us, the Republic had been founded on commitments which required that all the constitutional decisions on slavery issues be acceptable to elites in both free and slave states. Craig in the 1840s, Dred Scott in the 1850s, confirmed that on the court, constitutional bisectionalism gave slaveholding elites an effective veto. When bisectionalism finally broke down in 1860, the result was the comprehensive disintegration of the republic born in 1789, of its constitutional law, and of its one tribunal. Just as in 1775, the collapse of polycentric constitutionalism, whether located in jurisdictional claims made by the people themselves or in the dual spaces dominated by those who claim to speak for them, meant that Americans had no alternative but to fight another revolutionary civil war. Thank you. the reconstruction, at least ideologically sound like locals, and appeal over and over again to localism. Mm -hmm. um, the jury of the peers um, against the Freedmen's Bureau, uh, 
in position than a decentralized power. So I'm just wondering of the extent to which you want to push the local discipline. Um, See, because I, it, it, it seems to me to be able to be manipulated for so many reasons. I'll, for instance, I'll give another tracing trial, or not quite tracing trial, but um, in Thomas Dixon's book, The Third of the Trilogy of Klansmen, um, Reconstruction Trilogy, uh, a, he has a former Klansman being tried uh, as under the Conspiracy Act of 1870, which was the key down the Ku Klux Klan, which of course is a federal imposition, mm -hmm. um, suspension of habeas corpus, sure. all sorts of things, um, which anyone who's a localist would be absolutely All the way through the massive resistance yeah, in the 1950s. And, 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 yes. and, um, and his appeal was, um, how can I, this is a trial, trial a, a jury of my peers, hold it, look, they're African Americans on there, and so forth and so on. So there was a whole appeal back to the British tradition of liberty and, and, and the localism that comes through on um, there. So I'm just wondering, um, it seems to me, it, it seems to me that you had a sort of utopian, almost utopian ideal of this localism which would be so much more complicated. First, I, I, I could give some other examples, but I'll, I'll just stick with that. I, I don't think, I, I don't talk oh, about Maybe I'm misunderstanding your view. I don't talk about it as a utopian ideal. I talk about it as a phenomenon that exists or existed. <laughs> and therefore is appropriate for historical examination. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it would be just crazy to uh, deny, uh, particularly given its longevity, um, and it does last, you know, I, I, I did not mean facetiously when I, when I said, you know, all the way through massive resistance in the 1950s, because, you know, massive resistance was to, to desegregation to Brown, or the implementation of Brown, was in large part posed as um, a, um, a defense of locality and custom mm -hmm. against as an imposition. It was justified by the people. But I, I, and, and so I mean, but this is—I I guess you know—it's interesting. It's a very interesting question because it 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 the two ways because it 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 pulls at the edges of a sort of niggling dissatisfaction I've had with American history as a as a as a as a mode of um, um, inquiry. That is, you know, I don't have a normative axe to grind here. Um, I don't have utopian localism to 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 hold up. I, I simply have a phenomenon that I think is interesting, um, and if if we but, uh, did not you frame it in sort of a narrative of of, of declension? I mean, it, or, or I it may be that it may be. I mean, from from the from the from the point of view of the actors. It is a narrative of detention. So it would be kind of inappropriate not to frame it as a narrative of culture tension. Um, I think we have to be faithful to the phenomena we discover and to understand them. Um, and to be wary of also to be wary of judging them. Too swiftly. Um, it is, you know, one of the sort of the privileges and perils of history to be put in the position of uh, judging phenomena. No, I, I wasn't. I, I'm just. It sounded to me. I, I'm just. And then I'll, I'll be quiet. But it, it, it sounded to me that you were judging what was replacing a localism. And I was going to make a case that we shouldn't judge that too much, that too quickly. Either. That's fair enough. Grace? I want to kind of go back even further to like Henry II and the reforms uh, to the British Commonwealth system, to the creation of it. The jury had control over every bit of the um, adjudication at that time. And it was only through a period of uh, during a period of time that there were reforms in order to have a formal structure and to sort of take some things away from the jury. 
So in a sense, what was happening, I think what you're saying is that it was actually a reaction to those reforms and really going back to the very early system that was the British common law or the English common law. Is that correct? I haven't studied, I haven't studied, you know, the jury. Um, I said hence like the early history of the jury. Um, from what I know of it, I would not at all disagree with your with your observations. Um, it is it seems clear that by the seventeenth century, and I would not know when um, this this trend began, but certainly it seems clear to me by the 17th century, that at least in matters of note, uh, courts were very much, were most decidedly moving to control jurors, uh, particularly, you know, in, and, and to define the sphere of the jury. Uh, of course, you know, in, in, in 17th century England or in 16th century England, you will find the same kind of decentralized pattern of local determination of the peace that I've described this afternoon, that Laura Edwards describes in, in her wonderful book on uh, post-revolution South Carolina. So it's, it's not the, you know, the, the phenomena repeat. Um, but it is, it does seem to me that the, um, the, uh, the early, the, by the 17th century, when you look at trials like Lowburn's, when you look at the conventicle type of trials, and so on into the 18th century, the jury is very clearly being represented as you know, limited, and it's in its functions and is being warned. I mean, when Mansfield says, "Judge by the law, do you do so at your peril?" Uh, he is telling the jury that you know he can throw them in jail, and he can. We have a reception out here that I hope you'll join us at. Please again join me in congratulating. Thank you.